And I'll read a bit of it, because it's interesting. I struck it out, but I'll read it, because it is kind of interesting. He tells how one may increase the productiveness of the land, and lessens somewhat the rigors of hard work and the heat uh, and cold of the seasons. He says, here's how you uh, make your life a little bit better. First of all, get a house. Get a woman for the house. Get an ox for plowing. And get a dog. Get all those. Work and save should be one's motto, according to him. The rising of certain stars and other phenomenon of nature should be observed. Prudent man would do that. Since peasants' estates divided equally among sons soon become too small, because you keep dividing them, become too small to support a family, Hesiod said it were better to bring up but a single son. So he said, just have one kid. Especially as heirs often waste the estates in litigation, and the judges are ready to give the verdict to the one who brings the largest bribe. So you can't even give it, give it to your sons anyways. Just have one kid. Packed though the poem is with good advice, whatever, that's fine, Hesiod is essentially a prophet of justice. The poem, oh, many of his ideas being borrowed from Ionia, he had a lasting influence on the next centuries. We are going to go in a bit here to Rex Warner, the Greek philosophers, and and the early philosophies, the philosophers there, are largely Ionian Greeks. Now it says Hesiod had a lasting influence on the next centuries. We skip a paragraph. The industries of the new age had their principal origin in Ionia and her neighbor Lydia, a country of diverse natural resources. The great plateau of Asia Minor was especially adapted to sheep raising, so that the textile industry quickly developed in the cities of the coast. Miletos won fame for her finely woven woolens of rich violet, saffron, purple, and scarlet colors, and her rare embroideries for the decoration of hats and robes. Pottery and wine formed other exports, though the number of small factories gradually increased in the cities, the economy of the surrounding district remained agricultural, obviously, but a growing industrial sector. Naturally, the extension of skilled industry was from Asia Minor to the Greek mainland. In the early days, that's the direction that uh, technology flowed. Aegina, whose scant soil forced the people to industry and commerce, produced bronze work, such as cauldrons, tripods, and sculptured figures and groups, in addition to small wares of various kinds. In Euboea, on the Strait of Euripus, Chalcis became a thriving industrial city, with bronze obtained in part from neighboring mines, and with the purple mollusk caught from the strait, she manufactured wares for war and peace, and costly dyes uh, for the wealthy. Now it had gone over, it goes over uh, trying to explain the development of industry. This city, city developed it for this, and that city developed industry because of that reason. And every time it develops industry, it's because of the cultural clash of some sort. Dis people are discontent here, and so they start doing this, or something like this, or this is allowed, or whatever. And, I don't know, just whatever. Trade is part of a culture, and it develops when it's allowed to, people. Just like dictators will crawl out from under rocks, um, ambitious men will come out from behind the trees. When, when the conditions are right and you're not shooting at them anymore, they'll come out and produce. So I think it's just a culture arose that allowed it. I, didn't, I don't think there's any you know, to resort to Marxism of any kind. In industry and commerce, Chalcis had eventually to yield to Corinth, from early time renowned for her wealth. Its citadel was Acrocorinth, a steep and lofty peak, commanding a view of the isthmus below and of a wide expanse of country all about. The two harbors, one on the Saronic Gulf, the other on the Corinthian, afforded easy commerce with east and west. Now, ladies and gentlemen, like I said before, you need a map of Greece out right now. I just don't have one big enough. Um, the, the, the Gulf of Corinth or uh, Corinth sits right there on that little teeny bit, right there near that bit of land, and it's like you can either sail all the way around Greece, or you go across there. But they couldn't cut a canal across there. In fact, they just got that cut 
you know, like uh, the last 150 years, 150 years, something like that. They finally got a canal cut through there. They didn't have one back then. They used to haul ships up over there, I'll mention in a minute. But you need to be able to glance at a map. So shame on you if you don't at least have a PDF of a map on your, on your desktop. Go look at a map of ancient Greece and just sit and stare at it while, while you're listening to this lecture. To avoid the hazardous doubling of Cape Melia, ships often unloaded here their freight, which was hauled across the isthmus. There was actually a pan-isthmian railroad in Panama. It would take cargo from one side to the other. And ships would come there, unload or load up, uh, and cargo would go across there. And that's how they did here. They actually moved ships across there. They moved ships across where the Red, where the Red Sea, not the Red Sea, you know, into the Red Sea, the um, Suez Canal. They used to drag ships across the sand there. Amazing. But uh, we're a little bit off. Eventually a dragway for pulling small ships across was constructed. The city was not only a mart, a uh, shopping area, but also a thriving center of industry, which produced wonderful vases. Under a new strong influence from the east, bronze wares for utensil and arms, well-woven and beautifully dyed woolen fabrics for clothing and tapestries, even the Ionians, not content with their rich native fabrics, welcomed the Corinthian robes of purple, sea green, hyacinth, violet, and brilliant red. In the vases were exported wines, olive oil, and toilet ointments. I don't know what that means. Under the leadership of the Bachiadia, the ruling aristocracy, Corinth began a momentous career, and often in friendly cooperation with Chalcis, extended its lines of commerce in various directions. Immediately to the north of Corinth was Megara, a little city-state with a narrow territory extending across the isthmus. The soil was stony, scarcely fit for anything but grazing. This condition compelled the Megarians to manufacture, with their scant means, coarse woolens and heavy potteries. Attica remained essentially agricultural, though she exported oil and wine in beautifully decorated vases. Her great industrial and commercial development belongs to the future. Uh, the one thing uniform to the Aegean world was discontent, varying in its cause from district to district. They were all discontent somewhere. Well, another thing that was varying was that they were all free to some degree more than other people. Oh, they were also less credulous, less uh, religious, uh, the only thing uniform? The one thing uniform to the Asian world was discontent. Eh, okay. So, Marxist, Marxist, Marxism, ambitious nobles, troublesome poor, Marxism, um, okay. Being an adventurous race, many Greeks decided on emigration as the best solution to their difficulties. Alright, so, in other words, Segue to talking about colonization. The two centuries from 750 to 550 are the period of colonial expansion. Now, from 750 to 550 was not the first time that the people from the Aegean had traveled west. For during the late Minoan period, colonies had been sent forth. And not long after 1000 BC, mysterious refugees or pirates left the neighborhood of the Aegean and settled in central Italy where they became known to history as Etruscans. Some knowledge of this earlier expansion may have existed to encourage the new colonists in their venture. Maybe it wasn't just discontentedness that led them to do it then, right? Maybe. After all, they were going to the unknown. Fortunately, however, much of the Mediterranean basin enjoys the same climate and scenery, so it wouldn't be so hard to adapt. Somewhat oddly, perhaps the natives, as a rule, were not hostile odd that they can go and settle and wouldn't immediately be attacked. As the expansion continued, more and more of the better sites being occupied, the Greeks found themselves opposed by Phoenicians, Carthaginians, and Etruscans. Now, they were opposed by people all along, as the other author mentions, the Phalanx and so on, allowed natives, uh, they allowed the Greeks to sort of manhandle the natives. This is our city. Uh, if you 